in part 5 of this message we talk about the practical day to day battles a believer faces in the mind and how to win these battles we learn how to renew our mind and develop a positive mindset all right why don't we stand up to our feet and make our declaration and uh, this morning let's just uh, say what god has taught us in his word uh, before we spend a few moments in god's word together if you brought your bible Please lift it high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold, and strong together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word, I believe His word, and I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to Him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll try and be quick here in, our, in the message this morning. We've been uh, talking about emotional wholeness and deliverance. We've been talking about several things in this area of emotional wholeness. How God makes us whole in the area of our mind, our will, and our emotions. The fact that He is the restorer of our soul. So we've been covering different aspects and facets of this whole uh, promise and whole thing that God does for us in the realm of our soul. We talked about problems and causes. We talked about how we can receive healing and deliverance. We talked about journeying into emotional wholeness. And last Sunday, we talked about some spiritual disciplines that we need to maintain in order to stay emotionally whole in our lives. This morning, I just want to build up a little further and talk to us about the conquest of the mind. Now, we have a publication available with the same title, so it's a little, that's a little uh, expanded version of what I will be bringing to you. So I'm just going to bring to you the, the key points of that whole uh, teaching or study uh, on the conquest of the mind. What we see in Scripture is that the mind, our mind, is a battlefield. It's a place where we are bombarded with all kinds of ideas, suggestions, thoughts that come into our minds. Some of it is just comes from people around us, the environment in which we live. You know, all kinds of thoughts. You're driving down the road singing hallelujah, praise the Lord, and there's a billboard staring at you in the face with a picture that's not very holy. You don't know what to do. You, you know, you were not intending to see it, but there it is. Hits you in the eye. Or maybe you're watching TV, or you're on the internet, or you're reading a newspaper or a magazine. Uh, these things hit us just almost everywhere. They bombard our minds. There could be ideas and suggestions that come from people who give us thoughts, ideas, which are against the truth. Some of it comes in our classrooms as, uh, as students, as you're studying and you're going through school and college. Your teacher, your professor uh, may say things and may push things as part of the education which are actually against the truth and against the Word of God. So these things uh, come to our mind uh, just about every other place. And of course, the enemy is also busy. Evil spirits inject their thoughts, their ideas, their imaginations into our minds. Now, there's nothing wrong with our mind. God created our minds. So put your hand on your head and say, God created my mind. <laughs> there's nothing wrong, nothing bad. You know, God gave us our mind. We must use it. Develop those faculties, your ability to think, your reason, visualization, your, you know, all the various faculties of the mind. God gave it to us. He designed it. He is the original designer. 
And so it's a good thing. However, because of all that it has been exposed to and uh, uh, over time, it has become corrupted, or the Bible uses the word carnal. We'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But all these thoughts, uh, ideas that bombard our mind, they do something to us. They, at a very basic level, they stir up certain thoughts, reasonings, and our own desires. And so I want you to see the connection between what you expose your mind to and the stirring up of the wrong kinds of desires in you. James puts it like this in James chapter 1. He says, verses 13 through 16, he says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So God is not the one presenting you with a temptation saying, go ahead, try it out. That's not God. But how does temptation happen? What is temptation? It's an inducement to do something wrong, to sin. How does it work? Well, James explains. He says, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, that means you give in to that, It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it continues, it's full grown, it matures, it only results in corruption and death and and decline and in the wrong end. So verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So none of us can say, the devil made me do it. No, 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 the devil didn't make you do it. My friend made me do it. No, your friend didn't make you do it. That billboard made me do it. No, the billboard didn't make you do it. All these things are only ideas that impinge on your mind. But what do they do? They stir up desires. Our desire. When every man is tempted when he's drawn by his own desires. So these things that bombard our mind, they serve to stir up the wrong desires. So there are two areas that you and I need to watch out. One is you and I can deal with the wrong desires in ourselves, get rid of them. But on the other hand, we've also got to deal with what we permit to impinge on our minds. Because those are the things that are stirring up the wrong desires. So we need to guard our minds. We need to know how to respond to the wrong things that come and bombard our minds. Of course, you can put up certain protections, certain defenses, but there are some, there's only so much you can do because, you know, when you're out on the street and a lot of things sometimes come inadvertently. You don't intend to do it, but there it is. It hits you. It strikes you. It strikes your mind of things that people say and ideas that, that float around in conversations between your, with your friends. I mean, they are friends. You're just spending some time and they're talking, but they're talking the wrong kinds of things. And so they bombard your mind. But you need to have a defense mechanism. You must know that your mind is a battlefield. Those things can stir up wrong desires in you. And if that desire is not checked, it will lead you to sin. Are you all with me so far? So we need to have our defenses up. We need to know what God wants us to do. You know, and uh, other things like deceptions, confusions, seductions, all kinds of evil that affect the believer, all start usually with a single thought that impinges on the mind. And that thought was not dealt with, and so it led to other things. Now, you know, the Lord Jesus, the Bible says, He was tempted in all points just the way you and I are tempted. Now, when the devil tempts you and me, he never comes in a black suit with two horns and a pitchfork and saying, I'm Mr. D-Evil. It doesn't appear that way. How are you and I tempted? It's in the area of the mind. So the temptations Jesus faced came to him the same way. Those thoughts, those ideas, those imaginations impinged on his mind the same way. He was out in the wilderness, but the devil gave him a picture of seeing himself stand on top of the pinnacle of the temple. He was out in the wilderness, but the devil gave him a picture of himself standing on the high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So it all happened in the minds. 
But how did Jesus respond? To each of the temptations, he simply said, it is written. Jesus used the same weapon that is in your hands. The word of God. He just said, it is written. So you understand how important it is to say what God says with your mouth? The very son of God, when he dealt with the temptations of the devil, he never said, angel Gabriel comes against you, Michael go and you know, call other angels. No, no, he simply said, it is written. He spoke the word that opposed that thought, that opposed that idea, that cast that imagination down. And so you and I must learn to use the word of God to counteract negative thoughts, negative ideas, wrong things that bombard our mind. So the Apostle Paul tells us this, that we must take every thought captive. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, he says, though we walk in the flesh. You know, we have to live in the flesh. And as long as we live in the flesh, you've got to fight this fight. So though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. We don't engage in fleshly methods. But he says in verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not man-made. But they are mighty in God. They are powerful through God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So notice he talks about different things that go on in the mind. He talks about strongholds. He talks about arguments, or the King James would use the word uh, imaginations. And then he talks about uh, every high thing, every high opinion, every uh, high idea, ideology or philosophy. Things that are against the knowledge of God. And then he talks about every thought. So if you look at it backwards, there is thought, there is argument or reasoning, there is imagination, and then there is stronghold. It all begins with every thought. The thought becomes an argument or reasoning in your mind. That becomes an imagination that could eventually become a stronghold. What is a stronghold? In this context, a stronghold is like a fortress. Literally means a fortress. It's enemy-occupied territory. The enemy has gained that ground. In your mind, in your thinking, a stronghold. Taking control. It's a fortress made with lots of thoughts, arguments, and imaginations. Are you with me so far? This is very quiet. <laughs> So Paul is saying, look, this goes on in the mind. He's addressing believers. So what must we do? We've got to start with a very basic level. Take every thought captive. The moment the wrong thought comes, the moment an idea comes into your mind, whatever the source, whether it's directly the devil or somebody else is talking to you, or something, in your mind, you've got to take that thought captive, bring it in subjection, bring it captive, make it subservient, make it a slave, to Christ, to Jesus. Otherwise, it'll progress to becoming an argument in your mind. Oh, yeah. Well, so you start your mind, starts playing on it, becomes an argument. And then it becomes, you know, an imagination. Now you see yourself in it. You begin to see yourself doing those kinds of things. You're, you're, you know, you're already in it through your imagination. And soon it can become a stronghold. Just now, the devil's got a grip over there. But the good news is even strongholds can be pulled down. They're just a house made of thoughts. And all of this, he says, we can combat them with the weapons of our warfare, which God has given to us. And like I mentioned earlier, the primary weapon that God has given to us here is the word of God. Use the word to say it. So the moment a wrong thought comes, I mean, I'm just making this up. 
Some of you think, why don't you just lie your way out of this? Just, just one lie. You can lie your way out of this. Immediately, you got to counter it with the word of God now. Simple word. We all know Psalm 23. It says, he leads me in the paths of. So if it's not a righteous path, God is not leading you down that. Just so no, my God leads me in the paths of. Simple. You use the word, counteract that wrong thought. But if you don't do that, then that lie becomes a little bit of reasoning. Yeah, man, it's okay. You know, on Sunday I can go and tell God, I'm sorry, I've got four days. <laughs> little reasoning is going on in the minds. And then it becomes an imagination. Now you have a clear, short movie on how, you, how the whole thing is going to play out. He's going to come to me. And I'm just going to say a lie. And fine. And then I'm going to do this. It's all done. So you've got this whole thing played out in your mind. It's become an imagination. Now... You're under its control. It's become a stronghold here. You're actually going to do it. And the problem is, if you do it once, the second time makes it easier. The progression is faster. And soon, it could be, you, I mean, I'm just making this up here. I'm not pointing at anybody. You could just become a habitual liar. Just a normal reaction. You want to get out of something? Just say, this is so easy. Now lying is a stronghold. But how do you dismantle a stronghold? Just go back to the Word. Download the APC Church app. <laughs> go to the section on principles. There is a topic called integrity. Meditate in those scriptures seven days. Once a day, seven days a week, you'll be fine. <laughs> no. But there are, basically, you need the Word of God. So you need those scriptures that teach you, you must walk with integrity. So you meditate in those scriptures and you begin to declare, no, he walks uprightly, walks, in sec uh, walks securely. I'm going to walk uprightly. That's a place of security. He walks in integrity. He will not be ashamed. He'll not be put down. I'm going to walk in integrity. No. And so you meditate in those verses. So next time uh, an idea comes, a thought comes, why don't you just lie your way out of this? No, 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 no. The word says, the word says, it is written. That's how you counteract those wrong thoughts. God has given us this weapon. So we have to take every thought captive, cast down wrong imaginations. We have to pull down these strongholds with the word of God. But then there's another important thing the Bible tells us, and which is to renew our mind. See, by default, all of us have what the Bible calls a carnal mind. Meaning, a carnal mind is a fleshly mind. By default, our predisposition is to do what pleases the flesh and go according to the ways of the world. Because we were born in that environment. We were raised up in that environment. That's our default response. That's a carnal mind. But there are problems with a carnal mind. In Romans the 8th chapter, and I'm just summarizing it. Uh, the Bible tells us that a carnal mind desires the wrong things of the flesh. In Romans 8, 5, it is patterned after the ways of the world. The carnal mind resists the ways of God and the thoughts of God, and it is not subject to the ways of God. Romans 8 and verse 7, a carnal mind does not please God. Romans 8 and verse 8. And a carnal mind results in death. Romans 8 verse 6, meaning it's going to lead you down the path of destruction. If I live according to the carnal mind. And Paul, uh, uh, you know, he reprimands the believers in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 3, 3, he says, you know, you believers, you are carnal. Because, and you're behaving like mere men. So a carnal mind. And if, if believers live according to a carnal mind, it causes us just to behave like ordinary men. So what does, what's God's antidote? God's antidote is, believers, you need to renew your mind. And we know this scripture, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Do not, and I beseech you, brethren, present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed. That Greek word there is metamorphosis. How a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Be transformed. By the renewing of your mind. Renew your mind. So as believers, we are supposed to walk with a renewed mind. 
So you can have two believers. One believer is with a carnal mind. The other one is with a renewed mind. Both can speak in tongues. Both can, you know, love, say they love God, all of that. But you will find their ways clashing. Because one is walking with a carnal mind. One's walking with a renewed mind. Both love Jesus. But you're not supposed to live with a carnal mind. You're supposed to have a renewed mind. How to be renew our mind. Isaiah 55, verses 7 through 11. God says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. He will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So he says, you know, wicked man, you let go of your ways, let go of your thoughts. And God says, come. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there, but water the earth and makes it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. The context there. Wicked man, you forsake your way. You forsake your thoughts. I'll introduce you to something else. My ways and my thoughts. And they are so higher than man's ways and man's thoughts. But how do I get that? He says, look, just like the rains come down, my word comes down. My word's accessible to you. His word enables you and I to embrace his ways and his thoughts. So we renew our mind as we learn and as we train ourselves to think in alignment to the word of God. That's a renewed mind. A renewed mind is thinking according to God's ways and God's thoughts. Not according to a carnal mind that is man's ways and man's thoughts. A renewed mind is what we need to see a transformation of our life. Our life whole, the way we live changes when we live according to a renewed mind. A renewed mind is called a spiritual mind. It results in life and peace. A renewed mind is able to reject wrong thoughts and wrong ideas. It thinks according to Philippians 4.8. You're able to think on things that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely. Things that have good report and things that have virtue. Things that are praiseworthy. So all of us need to renew our it's an ongoing process. May you read the word of God. You get rid of the old ways of thinking. And you begin to take on God's ways and God's thoughts. So that in any situation, your response is going to be God's ways, God's thoughts. That's living by a renewed mind. I, I want to close with this. And we must learn also to develop a positive mindset. That means we must be able to look at situations, be, look at things in life from the perspective of God's words. That's a positive mindset. A very quick example in the Bible. Read about this in the 13th chapter of Numbers. You know, Moses sends the 12 spies to go spy out the land. All the 12 spies have given the same assignment and they've given the same promise. God said, that's the land I'm giving to you. Go spy out the land, figure out how we're going to take it. It's yours. They all see the same giants. They all see the same fruits. They all see everything same. They come back. Ten of them say, there are giants in the land. And we are like grasshoppers in their sight. Two of them see the same giants. They come back and say, there are giants in the land. But they are bread for us. Let's go. Because God is with us. What was the difference? Two of them saw their problem through the promise of God. Two of them saw their problem sized up against their God. That's a positive mindset. Amen? And so you and I, Whatever situation you're faced in, 
We must learn, what does God's word say about this? This problem is not greater than my God. This problem is not greater than his promise. I can still, you know, triumph over it. I can still overcome it. I can still conquer it. Because God is on my side. When we do that, we can walk with a positive mindset in any situation, any circumstance. Amen? All right, just wake your neighbor up. <laughs> Tell them it's over. All right. I just want to share some, you know, some testimonies that came in. Then we're going to take some time to pray. So, to quickly summarize today's sermon, four things. The mind is a battlefield. Two, we've got to take every thought. Three, we've got to renew our mind. Fourth, we've got to develop a positive one more time. First, mind's a battlefield. Take every thought. Three, renew your mind. Fourth, develop a positive mindset. All right. Okay, before we pray, I just want to share some different testimonies that came in. Now, I, I mean, and I understand we normally don't take time to share testimonies, but I just thought we'll do it. Uh, here was a testimony that came in from a young man, and it actually came to us by email uh, early part of July. Uh, and I'm just quoting a few, few things that he wrote in his email. He's not with us right now. He's gone back home. He said, I was chained to pornography and with it had many sicknesses. I was in depression, had a low sense of self-worth, had challenges at workplace. I was addicted to smoking. 26th May, I went to the APC youth camp. When he came out of the camp, he said, God broke my addiction to smoking, to pornography, drove out all the sickness. My parents, this is the true test. My parents see the change in me. Since the time I returned from the camp, my mother, this is a truer test. My mother noticed there is no smell of cigarette on my clothes anymore. My superiors at work noticed that I'm not easily given into anxiety and developed a good work ethic. All these things God has done in me, it's been 40 days since the youth camp and I've not gone back to my old ways. <laughs> Amen. That's a good testimony. Now, just another testimony here. You know, about maybe a year ago, a little less than a year ago, we had a couple from our Nepali church. One of you know we also have a Nepali congregation. Uh, they came to the church office, and uh, uh, the wife, uh, she had had by that time, I think, two or three miscarriages. I forget it. I forget exactly the number. But it was, she was so severely depressed because of these repeated miscarriages that she had had. And when they walked into the room, I was, I was like, God, how are we going to get her out of this whole thing? You know, she was so depressed. And the husband and wife sat down, and uh, they told what had happened. And then I just did a very simple thing. I just turned to Exodus chapter 23, and I read to them verses 25 and 26. This is what God said there, he, and this is the old covenant, but... Uh, this is, you know, we're in a better covenant. I, he, he said there, you will serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. So that was all. Just said, look, this is what the word says. That God said in his words, no one will suffer miscarriage. This is your word. You hold on to it. And God did something through those simple verses. She just came out of that depression that she was in. She believed that word. Shortly thereafter, they conceived. Two weekends ago, they gave birth to a baby boy. <laughs> Wonderful testimony. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.